This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We are going to talk today about what's happening in Ukraine. We're joined right now by a journalist who's written extensively in The Intercept, a reporter who's looked at the role of neo-Nazis in the war. The Ukrainian-born journalist Lev Golenkin is also with us. He recently wrote a piece for The Nation headlined The Western media is whitewashing the Azov Battalion. The piece looks at the neo-Nazi roots of one of Ukraine's most heralded paramilitary forces. Earlier this month, Turkey released five former Azov commanders who are being held in Turkey. They flew back on a plane with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. Meanwhile, The Intercept recently detailed how an anti-Putin Russian militia that carried out attacks inside Russia in May is led by a neo-Nazi who who's maintained links with American neo-Nazis. That piece was written by Ben Maku, a national security reporter who used to work as a correspondent for Vice News Tonight. Ben's also just written a new piece for The Intercept about an American army vet wanted for murder in the United States who escaped to Ukraine to fight with the right sector, an ultra-nationalist Ukrainian militia. We're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, but Lev Galenkin and Ben Maku, we welcome you both to Democracy Now! Ben, I want to talk with you about um, the piece that you wrote, Russian Militia has links to American neo-Nazi and anti-trans figures. Why don't you lay out what you found? So the leader of the Russian Volunteer Corps, Denis Kapustin, is this well-known neo-Nazi figure, not only in Europe, but he also came to prominence in the United States when he hosted a podcast in 2021 with a man named Rob Rundo, who is the founder and leader of the Rise Above movement. This is a character who has been very involved with the online neo-Nazi community, but also his group uh, was at the Charlottesville riots. Some of them were indicted. He himself uh, came under probe by the FBI for some actions at Berkeley. And after those podcast appearances, I dug a little further, and Dennis Kapustin also had connections to this man named Christopher Polhouse, who is this four-year uh, Marine Corps veteran that now leads this group called the Blood Tribe, but most recently has shown up to uh, drag events in Ohio carrying a pistol, uh, doing the sig hail, and intimidating uh, protesters. So to me, when I started to see these connections with someone like Denis Kapustin, who very clearly has at least the quiet support of Ukrainian forces when he attacked Russia from Ukraine, it, it, it to me was very significant, especially when you saw that American weapons and American armored vehicles were allegedly used by the group. And uh, from what you can tell, how uh, extensive are the far-right groups in Russia and, and, and their possible connections to those in Ukraine? Well, far-right groups in Russia and Ukraine, they have had links before, but I, I would say, I mean, the Russian far-right groups, they, they are extremely anti-Putin. They had been in the past. I, I covered soccer hooligans in Russia in 2016. Uh, right on the lead-up to the World Cup, because many of them were talking about causing violence uh, at, the, at the World Cup in, in 2018. And these groups were extremely anti-Putin. They were—some of them had, had actually done uh, prison sentences for, for terrorism. And these are the types of figures that are now a part of the Russian Volunteer Corps. And, and, and to be clear, these types, of, these types of individuals are not only hyper-violent and have been involved in criminal networks in Russia, but they— are very much, you know, very, very pronounced neo-Nazis that, you know, adhere to extremely racist and violent ideologies. And these are the types of people that are involved in the Russian Volunteer Corps. Let me bring Lev Galenkin into this conversation. Um, ben, uh, Lev, can you talk about your most recent piece and also the significance of Zelensky flying back with Turkey with the permission of Erdogan uh, to the ire of Putin um, the, with the Azovstal um, leaders? Can you talk about who they are and what exactly this deal was? Yeah. Um 
The commander of Azov, who was this, this is people who were trapped in Mariupol, who gave themselves up to the Russians, and who, according to a prisoner exchange deal, were supposed to stay in Turkey until the end of the war. Uh, Zelensky broke that deal and brought them back. The leader, Denis Prokopenko, uh, he's somebody who commanded Azov, and he's the type of person who Western media says is an example of a, not a neo Nazi. Okay? Um, in, in reality, he came out of the Kiev soccer hooligan milieu. Uh, it's called the White Boys Club. Uh, I think the name speaks for itself. He's been photographed numerous times with a, a Totenkopf, which is one of the most common neo-Nazi symbols in the world. And he was part of Azov's beginning. Uh, he was part of Azov's beginning from 2014, from when there was still just a battalion form of a neo-Nazi gang. And it's it's one he's now returned. Uh, either he will begin his duties as commander of Azov again now, or he's already been in, reinstituted. But um, it's it's insane that he's the type of person who we look at and we say, you know, Azov no longer is commanded by far right groups. When when you have somebody like that, I mean. There has been criticism of your reporting, Lev, saying that you're making too much of the white supremacist influences, or the far right, the neo-Nazi influences, now in Ukraine, in the fighting against Russia, that, though they may have had their beginnings there. Um, can you respond to that? Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty insane that every time Marjorie Taylor Greene sneezes, uh, it's the second coming of Hitler. And yet, here we have two brigades, brigades of neo-Nazis, and we're perfectly fine with it. So, I mean, the, the, the way I look at it is you can support Ukraine without glorifying, without whitewashing neo-Nazis. And it's insane that we are doing this. I, it's, I think if I was reporting on neo-Nazis anywhere else, I wouldn't have gotten any criticism. But it's because they're our neo-Nazis, and we're celebrating them then I've gotten criticism. I mean, I think it's—I didn't start the obsession with Azov. Putin did, when he began this war. But also, our foreign service and our media began when they started celebrating them as heroes. So, um, I'd like—I mean, anybody who's criticizing this, it really doesn't matter, because I, I feel that t two brigades of neo-Nazis is too, too many, especially for us to be supporting. Can you talk about what happened at Stanford University on June 29th, the panel that it held from the Azov Brigade? Lay out the scene for us. Uh, the Azov has had uh, extensive tours of America with these uh, wives. Uh, Dennis Prokopenko's wife was one of them, as well as an Azov veteran. Um, they would tour, and they would do goodwill relationship building. And uh, they've been managed. They've been invited to Congress. They met with members of Congress. And twice, last fall and now last month, they've been to Stanford, which is incredible that you have this university, which, ironically, one of Stanford's institutes published what is probably the most exhaustive study of Azov's neo-Nazi links. Okay, so one of Stanford's own institute for combating extremism has tracked us off and has extensively reported on them. And yet, at the same time, Stanford invited them to campus twice. Both times, they've met with prominent people, with former Rus ambassador to Russia, Michael McFall, with uh, Francis Fukuyama. It's—and they, they're going there, they're projecting their uh, logo in, on the campus, which is a neo-Nazi logo, a wolf's angle. And uh, Stanford apparently is perfectly fine with welcoming them. Uh, the, the, the incredible part is that Stanford before has had a row when a lefty Jewish American cartoonist came on campus and who uses uh, sarcastically uses neo uh, uses Nazi imagery. When that happened, Stanford suddenly had a problem. Stanford started putting out statements and having events about how this could trigger students and how this makes people uncomfortable. And yet you have a neo-Nazi insignia, a neo-Nazi group on campus, and they're welcome. They're, they have the red carpet out for them. It's, it's, it's stunning and it's just irresponsible.
And uh, Lev Golinkin, I wanted to ask you, even before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, Ukraine had been—there uh, were numerous articles being published in, in Europe and the U.S. about how Ukraine had become a, 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 uh, a meeting point for far-right and neo-Nazi groups from the United States and Russia. There were regular conferences there. And, of course, we've had thousands of foreigners uh, volunteer to fight uh, against the Russian uh, uh, invading troops. Troops. Is, what is your sense of what proportion of these foreign fighters are also uh, neo Nazis? It's hard to get the proportion, especially these days, because there's just so much unreported, there's so much under the radar. It's the point is that Azov has remained a hub for neo-Nazis to come over, and they can get battlefield experience. It's, it's, it's no different than the networks of Islamists who recruited ISIS when they recruited people from all over the world to come and get experience. So you have this, and it's—Azov is only a tiny part of the Ukrainian military, but they also have—I mean, how many, how, many, how many world countries have actual neo-Nazi units? So Azov has used this war to their advantage. They've used it brilliantly, and they are they are tremendous fighters. And it doesn't help that um, America and Western media, the same media who spent seven years tracking Azov and tracking its neo-Nazi nature, suddenly at the beginning of this invasion suddenly turned around and said that all that all of a sudden this organization stopped being far right. It's 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 an incredible, and this is what attracted my nation article. It's just an incredible feat of whitewashing, with just denying reality, with Western media across the board suddenly saying, based on nothing, based on based on propaganda, that these that this entire group that attracted neo Nazis from all over the world, that we've reported on, has suddenly stopped stopped being neo Nazis, and now they're okay. Uh, it's it's North Korean levels of propaganda, and to see this happen in Western media, it's, it's rather disturbing. I want to bring back in Ben Maku. Um, ben, can you talk about the new piece just out today from The Intercept? Fugitive combatant wanted for murder, an army that escaped to Ukraine and fought the Russians. It's about a veteran named Craig Lang. Uh, tell us his story. So Craig Lang is an Iraq and Afghanistan war veteran, and he left the military in 2014 under very murky circumstances. He allegedly had an armed confrontation with his now ex-wife. He went AWOL on his base, and then he left the military. He says it was a dishonorable discharge, or he says it was a, uh, an other than honorable discharge, and the military won't actually clarify it, They'll, and the DOJ just says that it's a discharge. But following that, he worked in the oil fields in North Dakota and saw the news in Ukraine around 2015 and thought to himself, I want to go over there. And with a few Facebook messages and some exchanges with people there, he ended up uh, in Donbass, which at the time was a frozen trench warfare uh, against Russian-backed uh, separatists, but also Russian regulars. And he was fighting for a group called the Right Sector, which is a, a very ultra-nationalist organization that's sort of been this, or has been a popular meeting ground for foreign fighters for many years. Uh, it attracted lots of neo-Nazis, but also anarchists and, and, and essentially just radicals. And he was fighting in a unit of mostly foreigners that subsequently got uh, war crimes investigations into them, both by the FBI and by foreign authorities. And around 2017, he left, came back to the United States, and it's around that point with someone else uh, another U.S. Army veteran who also served in the right sector, uh, the DOJ alleges that he uh, schemed and killed uh, a couple in Florida uh, in, in a gun sale to finance a trip to Venezuela, where he was going to fight with uh, anti-Venezuelan government forces. Now, he apparently ended up getting to Colombia. He left and went back to Ukraine in 2018, 2019. And around that time, the FBI was on to him, and he ended up in Ukrainian custody. And since then, he's been in this back and forth, but uh, in courts. But what is really interesting is by 2021, he, right around the, the end of the year, uh, he appealed his case to the European Court of Human Rights. And that allowed him to stay in the country, but he was on essentially house arrest or key city limits arrest. 
And of course, we all know by February 2022, uh, the Russian uh, full-scale invasion of the country happened. And as that was happening, someone like Lang, who's, who's fought uh, extensively not only in, in Ukraine, but also for the U.S. military, ended up offering his service, uh, services up. And where did he end up uh, right away was the right sector. And he ended up fighting all the way till August 2022, at which point the Ukrainian authorities finally uh, booted him out of uniform. And now he's facing extradition again. But I, I think more than anything, why I found this story so fascinating is that Clearly, this war and, you know, we're seeing more and more just how much control the Ukrainian military has on what's been going on, especially in the early days. You know, a lot of things have slipped through the cracks. And I think there's no question that the U.S. military has had similar problems in their own prosecution of wars over the last 20 years. But I think, you know, when the Pentagon is offering up billions and billions of dollars to Ukraine uh, to defend itself, there needs to be some amount of scrutiny as to how the how its military and you know looking at things like Azov Battalion and right sector being involved in, in in their actual military apparatus and how that operates and how someone like Lang, who did fight for the country twice, could also serve with the military, knowing that he was facing extradition for you know pretty grisly double murder uh, that that involves a a very lengthy. Uh, a, a very lengthy set of court documents and allegations against him. Well, well Ben, I wanted to ask you a, a, a similar question. The, the, uh, is the situation in Ukraine analogous to what happened, uh, for instance, during the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan that drew jihadists from around the world uh, and, uh, and obviously became the basis for the development of al-Qaeda? Or is the fact that it is such a conventional war, not a guerrilla war, uh, making it a lot more difficult for these foreign fighters who come in uh, to stay very long or participate? I'm wondering your sense of that. So I've been covering this for many years, this exact network pipeline, because I knew very early on, I, I, I followed uh, several very ultra-violent neo-Nazi groups like the base and Adam Waffen Division. There was always a lot of ambitions to get these kinds of guys through to Ukraine. I knew of one ex-base member who actually ended up in Ukraine and fought, not exactly sure exactly which part or which unit he was with, but the Ukrainian military ended up kicking him and another American out of the country in the fall of 2020 for joining a neo-Nazi organization and trying to fight for the war. So we know that there, there has been secretive pipelines and networks, and I know from my own sources and my own information that that still exists. Now, is it to the extent to which we thought it could be? Uh, there was a lot of, uh, of analysts and experts saying that this was going to turn into sort of this ISIS-like network that was going to mimic very much so what the Islamic State looked like in you know, 2014, 2015, 2016. I would say, and I think many people who have been studying this, say that that hasn't happened, or at least we don't know exactly how that has happened. But I will say, looking back at someone like Christopher Polhaus, who's connected to Denis Kapustin, um, who's the leader of the Russian uh, uh, Volunteer Corps, this is a man who's now said he wants to go join the war in Ukraine. So I think the ambitions of the far right and seeing how this, this conflict continues, and you know, I, I've always said the longer it continues, the more opportunities for this sort of thing to happen will become. And, I do think the Ukrainian military and the authorities do not want this to happen, and I think they're, they're, they're vigilant to some extent. But I also think that in times of war, and uh, you know, I've, I've crossed that border into Ukraine to, through Poland, and I know how porous it can be, you know, the, the government has a lot on its plate, and I think trying to stop uh, American extremists getting over, while I think they can do a pretty good job of it, uh, there's no doubt that that could be a problem. And I think this is something that is sort of a, a wait and see. Uh, you know, when it comes to, you mentioned the Mujahideen, we didn't know exactly how severe that problem got and the formation of Al-Qaeda till quite a few years later. So I think it, it, the same sort of applies to, to the, the war in Ukraine. But as I said, we do know that those secretive networks, they do exist. Uh, I think they still exist. Uh, how, the scale, I don't think, is on the level of Islamic State or the Mujahideen, but I do think that these, these links and these international networks are, are, are very much around. Um, 
Lev Galenkin, um, if you can talk about Ben was just talking about Dennis Kapustin, um, who was described by the Anti Defamation League as a Russian neo Nazi. Can you talk about the Russian neo Nazi elements within Wagner? And I was like shocked to learn that Wagner was named the Wagner Mercenary Group by its founder for the composer Wagner, um, who was Hitler's favorite composer. Yeah, it's it's interesting because Putin's uh, justification, his excuse for this war, was to what he called denazify Ukraine. The the pretense he made for his illegal invasion for the war is that Ukraine has neo Nazis and Russia is going to invade and they're going to get rid of them. He did this because partly to partly because he didn't have any other excuses and also partly because he wanted to to tap into Russia's memory of World War II and fighting the Nazis back then. The irony is that. Uh, denazifying Ukraine is being done in large part by the Wagner group, which is uh, riddled with neo-Nazis. So uh, it's, it shows, I mean, first, it shows the hypocrisy of Russia that it's using neo-Nazis to uh, supposedly denazify Ukraine, where instead what they're doing is committing war crimes, uh, committing an illegal invasion on this. It's. Um, it's interesting because most neo Nazis split, you have a lot of uh, them splitting depending on how they view Russia. Uh, some groups of neo Nazis view Russia as the last bastion of the white race and they admire Putin and love him. You see a lot of, a lot of US in the far right, they view Russia that way. And then the, on the other side is people who view Russia as not even a white country, as a barbaric uh, Asian horde that Ukraine and Poland and the Baltics have to hold back. So depending on where and where one falls, that's why you kind of have neo-Nazis on both sides of this conflict. And they're, they have very identical worldviews. It's just it depends on how they see Russia and what happens, that they uh, go on one side or the other side of the conflict. And Lev, as a Ukrainian, as a Ukrainian American, are you concerned about what will happen about the empowering of the neo Nazis within Ukraine um, when the war ends? Yeah, I mean, I think you don't have to be a Ukrainian American or an American to just be concerned because uh, these people are getting a national profile. And the message that we are sending is that if you are the right type of neo Nazi, we will arm you, we will train you, we will take you to Congress, we will celebrate you across our media, you will be our hero. And for example, Facebook did the incredible, incredible move where they banned Azov, all Azov pages, they had them banned as a hate group. After the invasion began, Facebook announced that they still have Azov listed as a, as a hate group, but it's, they're going to allow posts praising Azov. In other words, yeah, they're a hate group, but, you know, hate groups can do good things, too. The, the good people on both sides. And this is what this war has, has created. And eventually, Facebook just wound up dropping us off from its hate, list of hate groups altogether. So uh, we're sending a very dangerous message that if you're the right type of neo-Nazis, we will not only work with you, we will celebrate you. And, and I think that message is going to be heard across the world, and, and it's deeply problematic. Ben, we have 20 seconds. Your final comments from your research with years in Ukraine. Well, I would agree with Lev that, you know, when this ends, that's going to be the real question. I had someone from the Azov uh, movement tell me, who was quite senior in the political side, say to me in February 2022 that Ukraine's going to be the next Texas of Europe because there's so many weapons there. And I think when this is all over, that's going to be something that we're all going to have to face as a security issue in Europe. And I think when you have far right extremists who might have access to that, that may be quite a problem to look out for. Well, we're going to leave it there. Ben Maku, national security reporter uh, for The Intercept, will link to your pieces there. And Lev Galenkin, Ukrainian-American journalist, will link to your recent piece in The Nation, The Western Media's Whitewashing the Azov Battalion. I'm Amy Goodman.